All right, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, beginning in verse 50. The Bible says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Be preaching this evening on the thought, I'm looking for a change. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the kindness that you've shown to our church. Lord, we pray that you would add to our church as you see fit. Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen us in this last time. Lord God, we pray for our nation. Uh, we stand and quiver sometime at the thought that how she stowed you aback, Lord, and uh, have uh, give up on what you've given us. But Lord, we pray for repentance. Lord, we pray that we might see you move in a great way. Lord, be with the sinner tonight. Lord, that you'd speak life to them. Those that sit among us, Lord, that don't yet know you, we pray that you would manifest yourself to them tonight. We'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, some familiar verses of Scripture, uh, very much, no doubt, talking about uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming. Uh, we're going to look at it a little bit different tonight, but I do want to review some base points that we already all know, but is worth uh, saying. Uh, he begins, now this I say, brethren. He is addressing people who are saved. And throughout the Bible, many times it's uh, addressed brethren, but he's talking to the church. That's the female members as well, the sisters in Christ. Uh, they're included in this. And he says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Right. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, Irregardless the way we go, if we go by the way of the grave or go by the way of the catching away, either way, this cannot inherit the kingdom of God because it's corrupt, it's sinful. He did not, he did not save this housing when he saved my soul, but rather he saved the inner man and that person is eternal. Now I'll go even further to say this, whether you're a believer here or not, if the Lord's spoken life to you or not, your soul is eternal. You can have eternal life or eternal death, but your soul is eternal. Yeah. It will go on and on and on somewhere in some place. The, that part of man is eternal. Sin has wreaked havoc on this one, and it's not eternal. But the inward man is eternal, and it will go on and on somewhere. The thing that you have to really consider tonight is this. Where will it go on and on at? Where, where will your final judgment be? So he makes it very simple and very easy to understand the nature of this. Then he says, and, shall, and cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we'll make some delineations. The kingdom of God is the abode of God in heaven. When we're called away to the third heaven, if we go in the rapture, or if we give up this life and we go on to be with the Lord, that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of Christ will be here on earth. He will rule literally for a thousand years from the throne of David, and he will be king here. God Jehovah is king there, and he says, we can't go there in this. We have to, and you know, one of the most difficult things after uh, 260 years of peace and prosperity in our nation, we don't even understand what a monarch is. That, that is a ruler that if he says jump, you ask him how high would you like me to jump. And, and we don't understand that. We are so, so prideful in our freedom. And I'm glad we've been placed in a free country. But listen, it's nothing to boast about. We have to understand a kingly authority. In that, in that dominion, we will. So he reminds us, uh, 
of the situation of the catching away and being removed from this place. Verse 51, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. We shall not all go to the grave. But we shall be changed. Yeah. Now, we know that that is a physical change. We are going to look different. We're going to present different. I don't know what the, the, the new body will appear like. I know when John saw his vision, he looked and saw one walking in among the candlesticks. And he had a, a white robe on. I believe that to be the person of Christ. I don't uh, know what we'll look like, but I do know we'll be different because it says that you'll be changed. You, you will be different. The Bible also says there will be neither male nor female. I do know that that is a piece of it. I don't understand all of the kingdom of God, but I do understand those two pieces. It will be very, very different than it is here. Now, in addition to that, and again, we all know these things concerning uh, the catching away of the, uh, of the Lord's people. But I, 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 wanna, I want you to think about this tonight. Is being changed. Now not this corruption. Putting on incorruption. Which is what verse 53 says. Or 52 excuse me. Have you been changed? Now if you've not been changed. You're not saved. If you don't. If you've never been changed. I don't care how many professions you made. I don't care who was preaching. Or any of those things that go with that. But the Word of God will show you tonight. If you've not been changed. You're not saved. If you haven't had some kind of effectual change in your life. All you have is a profession. All you have is I said so. All you have is this is the way that I perceive it. And listen dear friend. That's not enough to face eternity with. If you've not been changed, you need something. You desperately need something. Because listen, eternity's coming. Eternity's real. Amen. And so we see then, we as the Lord's people, uh, certainly need to make this thing known. That the changing is something that we have to look for. It's not a real pleasant teaching today, but we do have to look for it. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew now. Matthew chapter 7. And we'll begin reading in verse 16. The Lord Jesus Famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew uh, 7, verse 16. Matthew 7, verse 16. The Lord Jesus says in His own words, You shall know them by their fruits. Now, who is He addressing? Well, He's addressing individuals. He's addressing a large number of people, including the apostles. And I will just throw this in. They weren't apostles yet. Because that office had not been created by the Lord Jesus yet. So they were disciples. They were followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. They were disciples of John. There were just a multitude of people there. And he says very clearly, you'll know them by their fruits. You don't have to ask them, have you been born again? You'll know them by the fruits. That's not popular teaching today. Now that doesn't mean that we go around and judge. But you know what? And we'll see in a minute. There are things to look for. And if they're not there, then I become concerned. Do I think you're lost? I'm going to say, you're lost, you need something different? No, no. But it does direct my prayers because if this word is true, and it is, then we can look and say, uh-oh, we have a problem. And um, uh, so we as the Lord's people then, we need to understand <laughs> and know that, that the reality is <laughs> that we have to look for changes. We have to look for differences. We have to look, when someone says, I've been saved, we have to look for fruit. Verse 17, even so every good, for, good tree bringeth forth good fruit. It just makes sense. Don't it? If it's a good, sweet tree, it'll bring good, sweet fruit. If it's a corrupt tree, it will bring forth corrupt fruit. That is so easy to understand that we don't even grasp the knowledge of it. You know why? Because huh, we perceive lying as compassion. 
right? If I took in my hand someone that I knew, that I just read their entire workup from patho pathophysiology, and I knew that they were dying with cancer, and I knew they only had a day or so to live, if I went in there and said, hey, you're going to be fine, I would never do that as a nurse. And it's foolhardy for me to, say, to tell someone that has corrupt fruit in their life to say, hey, you're going to be fine. It's a lie. It's a lie. And so then we, we can look very, very easily then and, and say, okay, do I have these things in my life? Do my children have these things in their lives? Do my grandchildren have them present in their lives because this is fruit? Verse, uh, verse 20, very quickly. Wherefore, because of, therefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, in the political arena, pretty easy, ain't it? It's easy to call Hillary Clinton a modern day Jezebel. Because that's exactly what she is. And you know how I've come to that? I've seen her rebellious ways for 25 years on TV. I know who she is. Right? Then why would we ever take a profession from someone still living like dogs? Right? It doesn't go that way. We can know. When I'm, out, when I'm pushing up daisies out there, I hope I've left something behind that you'll know. You'll understand and you'll know. And, and so we see then as the Lord's people that the fruits must be there. We as Baptists have about got to the point of on sovereign grace that, that you know, primitive Baptists teach this. And listen, we're almost there as a people. Primitive Baptists teach people can be saved and not even know it. You know what? That's heresy. Because fruit will come out on them Every time. And I'll even go a step further. The Bible says those that are saved will confess His name. So how could you possibly be saved and not know it? That's foolishness. And, and so we see then that as uh, the Lord Jesus was preaching, He was giving them warning. He was giving them some information. By their fruits you will know them. Think about Judas Iscariot. You know what? If they were in tune, the other 11 would have known it. You know what? He was always cutting a shine about money, was he not? The Bible says of him himself, he was a devil from the beginning. Somebody missed something, didn't they? Somebody wasn't paying attention. They could have known. I, I, I am in full assurance they could have watched Judas more carefully. And so we see, we see then, we as the Lord's people, we need to be astute of these things, and we need to have our eyes on them, because listen, as much as we love our dear children, don't you ever talk them into anything. The Bible says when we do that, they're twofold, twofold more the child of hell. Be very quick, careful. I want my children, I want them all to be saved and be in the person of Christ. But to, as much as I want it, all I can do is tell them of the goodness of the Savior. There's nothing further that I can do. And, and that makes us feel helpless very frequently. But look at their fruit. Now go and to Galatians chapter number uh, 5. You know these verses as well as I do, but uh, they do bear our review tonight. Galatians Chapter number 5, and we'll begin our reading in verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you'll look there, that's the large capital S Spirit, indicating that this Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. So let, let, let's read why it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is flopping around on the ground and bumping at the mouth. No. That's what some people will teach, is it not? The fruit of the Spirit is saying the sinner's prayer. No. 
Doesn't say that either, does it? The fruit of the Spirit is having a time and a place. Nope. Doesn't say that either, does it? The fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, people that present continually with a haughty, hateful spirit, they're missing the first one. Are they not? And listen, we become calloused by this world. I understand that. Listen, I'm out in it every day, and I am amazed at the generation that we brought up. I really, truly am. I am I'm bored by it. But, I should can retain a spirit of love. Love. Joy. But we'll go back to love for just a second. What do you love? What do you love? Because we all love more than one thing, right? I hope, <clears throat> I hope I can say with all truthfulness, I love the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything. I hope I can say that. I really do. That's why he says, forsake all and come and follow me. Do I love Donna? I love her more today than I did the day we said I did. But I have to love my Savior more. What about video games? What about the TV? What about Ancestry.com? I'll throw my own in there. Right? We love those things. What about your job? What about your pickup? What do you love? It really does matter, does it not? Love. Do you love Christ? And do you love the gospel enough to tell someone of it? That's love. Joy. You ever, ever went in somewhere and just like Eeyore comes in the room with you and that dark cloud and like, oh, oh, it's me. Ain't much joy there, is it? You met those people, just a black rain cloud comes with them everywhere they go. Uh, I mean, the glass is never half full. Right? Does that speak of the things of God? It really does, it does it not? Love, joy. You know what? Next Tuesday night, we'll have a new president of the United States of America. Whoever it be, we need to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Even if Jezebel arrives at her post, we need to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's joy that you have to look for, is it not? We have to rejoice in that. Love, joy, peace. Man, we're a miserable people in the modern day, aren't we? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. What about your faith? How's it measuring up tonight? You know what? We have more faith many times in this world system than we do in our own God. Don't we? So there are fruits in individuals if they are saved. Right? And if we are missing the biggest portion of these, the only conclusion by their fruits you will know them is they don't have anything real. And that is cutting words that day. Brother Lafferty, you're being judgmental. Oh, you can't say that. Yes, by the word of God, certainly we can say that. They don't possess fruit. Right? Up on the, uh, up on the edge of our house where, the, uh, where, where our woodshed is, there's a huge hickory nut tree. And I cannot imagine... How much of that mess we have picked up. And hickory nuts are good. My, my grandmother used to make a hickory nut pie that was really better than a pecan pie. It was really, really, really good stuff. Now we, have, we, we scoop them up and throw them down the hill so the kids won't fall on the sidewalk with them. But you know what kind of tree that is? It's a hickory tree. And you know how I came to that conclusion? Hickory nuts are falling off of it all the time. And so... If we don't have these fruits, how could we possibly claim the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
You know what? What you really do when you do that, you say, oh yes, I'm saved, and you run your boss down, you run your, you run your pastor down, you run your church down, you run, uh, you drag whoever you can through the, mat, the, the mud. You know what you're really doing? You're, dra you're dragging the Lord Jesus Christ through the mud. Because you're saying, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm rebellious, and I'm mean, and I'm not going to submit to authority. You drag in the person of Christ through the mud. And so we see then, as the, as the Lord's people and one of the Lord's true churches, man, we ought to love. We, we ought to be glad. We ought to be happy. We, we, we ought to convey a spirit of love. Now, with that said, and I'm not going to get into too much details, because I had a class one time, and I was teaching the class, and an individual became very upset and said that I was out to get him. That was not my purpose. But I wasn't going to mold just because he said, You're, you don't like me. You know what? I didn't change my material. And listen, the Lord God of heaven, just because you're a little upset, he's not going to change his material. It's going to be, thus saith the Lord. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either on or you're off. One or the other, right? And so we as the Lord's people would be certainly thrilled and glad and to possess this fruit. It should be our desire. Uh, we almost need to be covetous of them and, and want them in our lives. Go with me to the book of Acts. Now we'll look at an event that happened to Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, in the very first verse, very, very familiar verses of Scripture. And Saul, yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Now I want you to see that, that Paul's attitude was not that of seeking Christ. In fact, his express purpose was to break down things down there uh, and arrest those people and bring them down back to Jerusalem. That, that was his desire. Now, I will say this, and there's no way to know this. I do know that he heard one good sermon before this event. And I'll go this far. If you never had to hear the gospel, you'll never be saved. Again, a difference between us and our primitive Baptist brethren is you have to hear the gospel. And you have to hear the right gospel. Right? I can tell you you need to be baptized, but listen, that won't help you. Either, right? Completely of grace. That's what you need to hear. Not joining the church, not saying a little Mickey Mouse prayer. I mean meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, right? And so we find here that uh, Paul uh, had, heard, had heard Stephen preach a stout message on this, the day of his stoning. Verse 2. And desired of him, meaning the high priest, letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, meaning the Christian way, meaning one that is a believer, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. Now, when the Lord saved me, I didn't see no light. But I'll tell you this, the light was turned on. Because for the very first time in my life, I saw myself completely helpless and hopeless. And if you've not seen yourself in that light, you're not saved. Very well-meaning people will say, do you want to go to hell? Well, I never know anybody. I mean, I, you know, I really want to go to hell. That would that'd be, that'd be thrilling. That's foolish. What they need to be asked is, have you been convicted of your sin? What they need to be asked is, do you, do you, uh, do you understand and know you lost? They need to be told, do you understand and know you're in desperate need of a Savior? 
That, that's what the thing... And so as Paul is making this journey in, uh, a light clicks on, and of course we know the Lord speaks to him, but I'll tell you this, if you're to be saved, what must happen is a light has to click on somewhere that you need salvation. A light has to keep click on somewhere how dreadful and wicked you really are. And if that's not happened, listen, you're still lost. You can say it what you will. You can go where you want to. But listen, you're still lost. And if you've made one of your little pity pat prayers, and you've gone through the Romans road, and all the foolishness that goes with that, and you're still in rebellion to your parents, you're in rebellion to God, you're in rebellion to your wife, listen, dear friends, you're still lost. We need to know. The light needs to click on. When the light clicks on, you see yourself for who you are. It's so dreadful you wish you could shut it back off. You know, and, and, and that's an ongoing thing even for the believer. The longer I'm saved, the more appalled I'm at at depravity. And I'm talking about my own depravity. And so if, you're, if, you're look, if you've never seen yourself fully depraved, you're not saved. If Christ doesn't come first, you better call, make your calling and election sure. You better know what you have. Verse, two, uh, verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest or punish or hinder thou me? Now, listen, the day the Lord saved me, I didn't hear Larry, Larry. But I, do, I did have this. The gospel meant something to me more than it ever had before. I don't even remember hearing the gospel for the first time. I truly don't. I was in church was so young, I, I don't even remember. But I do remember this when it became effectual to me. When it went from being a routine thing till it made me, that light came on. I saw how sinful and how needy I really was. And then him say, Larry, Larry. You know, if, if you don't have something that aligns with that, you, you need it. You desperately need it. Listen, th this thing is almost wound up. We are almost done. We are going home. And we sit, we sit by idle and have dear loved ones just go on about their business. We need to realize this. Verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I'll give you two things, and the reason why I say that, that uh, message from Saul, I mean, that message from Stephen, sometimes before. See, for the pricks to happen, and that's a gouge, and that's what you go to horse with. For those pricks to happen, you have to have heard of the gospel. For those pricks to happen, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of man. It's a work of the Holy Ghost. If you don't have a time of pricking where you're being gouged by your sinfulness and gouged with the answer of sin, the person of Christ, I'd say you're still lost. You say, oh, you're judging. No, no. I'm trying to give you fair warning. I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, arrive in Jesus in front of Jesus with blood on my hands. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling this for a reason. I want to stand guiltless before God one day. Not sinless, but guiltless. And I'm giving you fair warning. If you don't have something to line up with that, you probably don't have it. You probably don't know Him. You probably don't have the real deal. That should shake us up tonight. It, it should trouble us deeply. Uh, it, it should make us be very fearful of what lies ahead. Many times it doesn't, but it should. Verse 6, And trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, 
And it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, two things. Number one, we find a willingness on the part of Paul. What will follow redemption is a willingness. A willingness to follow him completely. A willingness to do where, go wherever he bids you. A willingness to put his plan above your own. A willingness to submit yourself. Uh, I've heard the term all my life. And, and, and it is a fair term. Submit to scriptural baptism. That, that's an okay term. Submitting is the, it is the thing. Another thing that follows those that are redeemed is submitting to a church. Aligning themselves one with one of the Lord's churches. Submitting to your wife and or your husband. Submitting to your mother and dad. And I don't care how old they are or how young they are. If mom called me right now and said, son, I need you to come over here, I'd be on my way. You know why? Because I'm submitted to her authority, even today. See, that will fall. And, and those who stand in rebellion, what did we just hear about the fruits? Go back to that verse. You don't have to go there. Read it this week. Galatians chapter number 5, verse 19. One of those things is witchcraft. And everybody thinks about hocus pocus and running around a cauldron and all that foolishness. You know what the Bible says? The very same word, almost, almost identical Hebrew words, witchcraft and rebellion are almost the very same word. In 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 20 maybe, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. <coughs> So, if you're rebelling to mom and dad tonight, if you're rebelling to your spouse, if you're rebelling to your supervisor at work, it's the same thing as committing witchcraft. Does that go along with the fruits of the Spirit? Certainly not. Certainly it doesn't. So, we see then, we as the Lord's people need a change comparable to this. Now, one final place, 2 Timothy. Again, all very familiar verses of Scripture. You are David quote them tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul writes, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, you look at this. This was the man that was saved on the road to Damascus. This was the man that went in rebellion to God. And he had this life-changing event. And now, he is ending his life ready and looking forward to meeting God. Now, you look back in the interim of time. And what was the bulk majority of his time from the day of his conversion to the time that he was that he was going home to be with the Lord? What was the bulk majority of his time consumed with? Jesus. The bulk majority of his time was consumed with the person of Christ. Now, did he get off track occasionally? Sure, he did. But he rebuked himself for it. The bulk majority of his time was spent in Christ. What is the bulk majority of your time filled with? That's a very good question tonight. Because whatever is all consuming, you be careful of it. Your time, your energy, your thoughts. You be very careful of that. Now I also want you to see that Paul understood the limitations of this life. I also want you to see that it specifically says I'm ready to be offered. Now, what he was saying, and it did happen just this way, he lost his head. You know what? He didn't lose his head by halfway being a Christian. He didn't lose his head by coming and sitting and checking out. 
He didn't lose his head by simply being nominal. That means every day. That means just a routine variety. He lost his head because he continually sought and, 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 and published the name of Christ. That's why he lost his head. I am now ready to be offered. Listen, are you? The Clinton started arresting folks tonight. Would you be even on the list for Stewart County, Tennessee? I think that is important, don't you? Because you know why, why Paul was, was marked? Because people knew it. People knew what he stood for. People knew that he was different. And he lost his head over it. Now that's what that's how that's how true believers in that day went out. And I think you're gonna see a repeat performance very, very quickly. Last thing we're gonna close, I fought a good fight. You ever thought about what a fighter has to do to say that? Now, I've never fought very much. I fought a couple of times. Not in a ring. I fought because somebody said something about my mother. And it didn't quite work out like the other individual thought it would. I thought I had a reason to fight. But one thing that you need to do when you fight, know your enemy. Know your opposer. Because listen, the devil is much, much more powerful than we think. He's not going to come with you with a sharp tail and a pitchfork. He's much, much too wise for that. He's going to come for you in the name of money. He's going to come for you in the name of music. He's going to come for you in the name of video games. He's going to come in. He's going to come in to you in the name of leisure. He's going to come with you with whatever you esteem the most. He's a deceiver. That's, that's what he does. He's an artful deceiver. And so, when we're facing an opponent, opponent and we're in that fight, know your opponent. And then know your ability too. Now, I can make a blanket statement. All of us have no ability. All of us have no ability. But we stand in one that does. Remember as he was writing, the Lord Jesus wrote and said, Think no thought what you will say when you come before them. That is Matthew 24. For I will give it in the day to choose. You know why he said that? Because he's with us. He, he, he fights the fight for us. So know your enemy, know yourself, how inadequate you really are, and know the means of Christ. Now when I say inadequate, listen, don't you... Use your inadequacy as an excuse to stop praying and stop studying. Our prayer life ought to be top on our list. It ought to be the biggest interest that we have in this lifetime alone to speak with Jesus. What could be any better? So we as the Lord's people, we need, we need, to, we need to strive the best that we can to be, huh, to be more than nominal. To illustrate a change in our life. Have you been changed? One thing to say, have you been saved? Quite another thing to say, have you been changed? Do you look different? Do you present different? Do you act different? Makes all the difference, doesn't it? Mm -hmm.